We did some good progress on this study, and there was a public meeting well attended. I uh, think those who made time. Uh, we are in the process of applying for the grant application and exploring what are the possibilities. Um, we have uh, Ashley Breyer, a transportation planning manager in the Packing Group Talks from Kedar, Kansas Department of Transportation, and Kendra Shen. He's a project manager with uh, Ferguson, I hope. Uh, he's a volunteer here. Any questions and how we are preparing, uh -huh. uh, they're happy to elaborate. Uh, Ashley, may I request you to present? Thank you. Again, my name is Ashley Briars, and I'm the Transportation Planning Manager here at WAMPO. And an update on the Conference Safety Action Plan. Uh, we have been working diligently to develop this plan. And like Chad said, we had an open house earlier this month. And while we were updating this plan, the funds released the uh, call for projects uh, that was that's due on July 10th. We were expecting for it to be due in September, and so we've kind of pivoted a little bit. And we're going to be submitting a grant application for a planning and demonstration grant for just over $1.1 million. And that will be piloting behavioral strategies and doing some before and after studies. Uh, Kay is uh, participating in the project, and uh, Maggie Wilcox is actually going to talk a tiny bit about their effort if Maggie's online. I am online. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Maggie. I can't hear you, Maggie. Oh, no. Okay. Um, how about now? No. We're going to try to fix the setting, I think. Okay. Well, so they can, can hear, hear on Zoom. They can hear on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I can talk. Okay. <laughs> um, so Kata is participating by providing local match uh, as part of the project, and they're providing a base of ten percent. So there's 20% required, and they're providing 10%. And then because we're applying as multiple jurisdictions, we get an extra 5%. So they're going to be providing us with 15% of the necessary match, which then the jurisdictions need to provide is just over $56,000, which is a pretty great deal. So we're, we're very thankful to Kate for doing that. And I can't hear Maggie, but... Kendra, can we hear Kendra? Last try. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Maggie. I don't know if okay. they can hear us. I can hear you, Kendra, but. Primarily, um, Ampa staff is working with Kendra and Maggie in putting together um, a demonstration grant application. Most of the projects that we were looking for were temporary, not like a permanent structures or pouring concrete, the types of projects. Um, 
I mean, when since this is new ground, we are remembering the economy. What are the um, I think we have a lot of potential for the final grant application, like real implementation grants that's upcoming in the next fall, I think, next year. So this is a great, uh, you know, great collaboration between DOT and local jurisdictions. Um, it's possible and that this will lead to the implementation plan. Uh, so that's where we are, and then um, in the meantime, if you have any projects that are related to safety, feel free to, you know, share with the BAPA staff and we'll continue uh, apply for the grant application, completing all the potential projects within our region. So actually, I mean, is there anything else I'm missing? No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't get this audio to work. It's all good. Uh, we're happy to. Uh, you know, work continuously with the jurisdictions and any questions or uh, input, we're happy and welcome to uh, receive those. With that, the next item we have is a coordinated transit plan. There's a survey on the website and while Ashley is still there on there at the podium, let me request Ashley to update uh, the survey. So we actually have, uh, oh yeah. And then uh, speaking of surveys, we have several surveys that are going Testing. on. Testing. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ah, thank you. Uh, so we do have several surveys right now. We are in the first round of public engagement for the MTP 2050 plan. And we've gone to a bunch of events and talked to people and had them fill out our survey for us. We're also holding stakeholder listening sessions. We had one last week and we have four this week. And we will also be doing some ones that are just open for anybody who wants to participate in July. The ones we're doing right now are for specific themes. Uh, and the survey will close on July 31st. And so if you haven't taken the survey yet, please do take it. Uh, we're trying to get as much input as possible and we've set a goal of at least a thousand surveys. So we're, we're a little ambitious. Um, the next, Thing. We also are working on a survey for the Coordinated Public Transit Human Services Transportation Plan. And this plan focuses on the transportation needs of older adults, people with disabilities, and low-income households. And this survey will close at the end of July as well. And then we have an electric vehicle uh, plan that we're working on, and it also has a survey. And the purpose of this survey is to understand your current knowledge of electric vehicles and any potential concerns you have with them. And that will close at the end of July as well. So if you haven't taken our three surveys, please do uh, take them so we can get your input. By, uh, oh, sorry. The electric vehicle one is August 31st. Thank you, Ashley. Um, most of the surveys are until July 31 and electric vehicle surveys until August 1. As you all know, the planning process is transparent to public and also seeking input from the public, uh, you know, first letting uh, everyone know whether in the right, right direction and two, is there anything we're missing? So these are the two things that is intent for these surveys uh, to seek input and make planning process uh, even better. And I want to thank all the staff who diligently worked on the weekends and evenings, going to various events in Wichita, and they did a great job. So the next item we have is um, tip administrative adjustment. That's Nick Flanders. Nick. Yes, thank you. Earlier this month, at the request of KDOT staff, we enacted a, a administrative adjustment to the transportation improvement program outside of the usual TIP amendment process cycle. Now, because this, because it qualifies as an administrative adjustment, because it's a relatively minor changes meeting criteria, it does not require the approval of the TAC or TPB to be enacted. So this is letting you know that it has happened. And the thrust of it uh, was that uh, 
uh, was to shift funds, oops, uh, was to shift funds between projects without any of their actual funding levels from the federal government changing. And it is on that uh, basis that it qualified as an administrative adjustment. So no one's getting any more or less than they were. They're just getting it from different funding programs. It's affected two local projects and two KDOT projects in the tip. So one is the Meridian Avenue project in Valley Center, and the other local project is the West Street Harriet upon Me project in Wichita. And the two KDOT projects were the KDOT 1R resurfacing preservation projects in the Wampo region, 2022 uh, bucket sort of project. It has no specific location within the area and the redecking of bridge number 113 on US 54. Now the Meridian Avenue project in Valley Center had $556,717 of highway infrastructure program funds on it, which were moved to the KDOT 1R project. Meanwhile, the West Street Harried Upon Knee project in Wichita had $3,089,097 of Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act funds on it that were moved in to both of the KDOT projects, $1.6 million to the Ridge Redecking project and the rest to the 1R project, both of which are able to use those funds quickly because they were advanced construction projects. And so they're now they're just getting that advanced construction money. And then KDOT distributed service transportation block grant funds were put onto the two local projects to replace the HIP and CRISA funds that were taken off of them. And this was uh, all uh, put into motion by uncertainty about uh, what uh, could or could not uh, be used on certain projects uh, upon the approval of the debt limit bill in early June. And now this is just the locations of the affected projects. You see that re bridge redecking project off to the west and then and the West Street to Harry de Pawnee and Meridian Avenue projects on the other side of the screen. Any questions on this administrative adjustment? It did have a different match requirement. It had a 0% match requirement. However, it did, the amount of funding on that project it was not up to 80% even before this was done. So it is not an issue. Thank you, Nick, and good question, uh, Sean. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, there's only one last item that is white uh, uh, the <laughs> walk bike rural Kansas active transportation summit that's in September 20. Uh, that's in McPherson, Kansas. It's the link is on the agenda packet, so you can feel free to see the link. Um, I think today the, we have agenda um, both on transportation improvement program as well as the long-range transportation plan. Some of the long-range transportation plan development is regional economic metrics, the economic impacts on transportation and transportation impacts on economy um, that all leads to long-range transportation plan. So we have two items and then also 5310 awards uh, lined up today on the agenda. With that, uh, thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you, Chad. Thank you, staff. So next we have uh, public comments. Are there any public comments? Anybody online or anybody in the room that would like to speak? Seeing none, we move to the uh, to the action. So we have two separate actions. And Ashley, would you like to talk about this? Thank you. The project selection committee met on June twelfth to discuss awarding the carbon reduction program funds, and then also some adjustments to 
some of the CRISA funds. So I'll talk through that. So when Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law in uh, November of 21, they developed a new funding program called the Carbon Reduction Program, or CRP. And this is all about reducing CO2 emissions from transportation. And so we received this suballocated funding pot similar to our Transportation Alternatives one, our STBG, or our CMAC pot of money. And we needed to uh, award projects. So due to some federal delays, we actually had three years worth of funding to uh, award to projects uh, this year. So it was just over, or just about $3.9 million of projects. The schedule for this process started with a call for projects on March 1 to May 1, and then staff scored the projects in May, and the project selection committee met to review the scores and the projects and make recommendations for awards. And then today, we're here for you all to make a recommendation. And assuming everything moves forward, then the projects will be voted to be included in the TIP uh, in October. And then we will be doing a combined call for projects for federal fiscal year 25 and 26, um, or I'm sorry, 25 through 28, uh, which will include the 25 and 26 CRP funding uh, from September 15th to January 5th of next year. There were six projects submitted for funding, and they include the Wichita Multimodal Facility, but specifically the bike parking and electric vehicle charger component of that, the Red Bound Path from Woodlawn to K96, Maple Street Pathway, which connects to Goddard, 45th and Tyler intersection improvements, 53rd Street multi-use path, and then the Seneca Street multi-use path. And this slide just shows the map of where all the projects are, and they're shown in blue. You can see they're across the area. And now Peter will actually talk about the specific recommendations. Thank you, Ashley. My name is Peter Morth. I started here a couple months ago. I'm the principal engineer here at WAMPO, and I'm going to go through just the different recommendations the PSC made. So first, uh, sponsored by Sedgwick County, the Maple Street Pathway, they chose to award about or $40,000 to this project. I know that's a little bit smaller for a project award. This one's already in the tip. This just brings it up to its 80% maximum federal funding match. Um, the next two projects, the 53rd Street Multi-Use Path, sponsored by Bel Air, and the Seneca Street Multi-Use Path, sponsored by Valley Center, were awarded about $292,000 and $417,000, respectively, and that should also bring them up to their 80% federal maximum. Uh, the next project, the Multimodal Facility, sponsored by Wichita, the PSC chose to award $1 million worth of funding, and as Ashley described earlier, that would go to the EV charging and bike storage components of the facility, but it's a very large project and has multiple different aspects to it. And then finally, the uh, PSC chose to award the remainder of the CRP funding to the Redbud Path project. It can't be known for certain until we get the uh, WAMPO sub-allocated funds for 2024 is exactly what that might be, but if it's the same as this year, that remainder should be about $2,234,000. Which brings us to the next topic the PSC considered. So in 2022, we had $700,000 of Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act funds, or PRISA funds, programmed and obligated to the WAMPO travel demand model update. However, at the end of the contract or the bidding process, the contract was only for about $568,000, $69,000, which left $131,000 that was obligated and programmed, but not spent. So we had the PSC come up with a recommendation for what we should do with those funds. WAMPO staff did have our own recommendation that we made to the PSC. And that was to take these funds, uh, assuming federal rules permit this, take this $131,000 that was unspent and obligated, de-obligate it and move it to a new project called WAMPO Travel Demand Model Update 
phase two, which would provide continued support after the consult is finished with developing this travel demand update, as this, these products are quite large and comprehensive and they're purpose built for the MPO they serve. And it would be wonderful to have continued support after the model is finished or the update is finished. And also important to note with this transition, as we talked about earlier and what Nick said, CRISA funds have no local match requirement, making this a little bit easier. So the PSC did, chose, did choose to uh, consider and recommend the WAMPO staff recommendation to de-obligate these funds and uh, award them to the new WAMPO travel demand update phase two project. Which brings us to our action options. So first, for the PSC, we you have different options for the CRP funds. We could choose to recommend the TPP approve the PSC's CRP fundings as presented, recommend to the TPT not approve the PSC's CRP funding, or choose to recommend with specific changes for our action item one. And then the second action item deals with those unspent but programmed CRISA funds. We can choose to recommend to the TPP to approve the PSC's CRISA funding recommendations as presented, choose to recommend to not approve the PSC's CRISA funding recommendations, or choose to approve with specific changes. Okay, okay are there any questions before we vote? CRISA funding, you said it yes so going back to what nick was describing earlier um it's uncertain with the debt limit deal that happened oh beginning of june that if we'll if we de-obligate those chrisa funds if we can actually get them back so that part's the uncertain section of this and actually motivated all of the funding switching around between those different projects as Nick described earlier. So we're hoping that's the case. If not, that's why we kind of put that if federal law actually permits us to do so because- So did the group discuss anything else as a secondary option to be able to try to do so? Or do you think the obligated is gone? That's the uncertain part. Yeah, we don't know for certain if we deobligate if they'll just be taken away. Peter, I have a question. Um, what is the, as, as the JEO continues to work on the travel model beyond this contract with this, if this works with the funding, what is their scope of work going to look like? We haven't put that into a specific RFP. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, we haven't put that language into a specific request for proposals. The general idea is these kind of travel demand models, they're purpose built for the MPO. Um, so there isn't anything, there's no off the shelf support for them. So if we do have issues with the model and they're quite complex, and if you don't have some local expert or people who have almost built the model prior, it, it's a little tough to get support. So we, we're hoping we could use this remainder of obligated funds, if we can get them, oh. to have continued support past the end of that contract for that model, which would be in 20, April 2024. Oh, sorry. And, and Peter, this is Allison Smith at KDOT. I just wanted to pop in and say that this will have to be a new procurement. So for the next phase of this, it may or may not be the current consultant. It may be a different one. Um, federal rules do require a new um, procurement process. Thank you, Allison. Uh, that's a good question, Tia. Um, the scope would be to update the model and then serve the jurisdictions with the needs of uh, uh, sub area projects so thank you are there any further questions 
Has there been another community that's done this as like precedent? Uh, are you referring to just continuing support past the? To change the funding and then oh, gotten it back. So this is actually a, a more novel situation. It, it has to do with the, the debt ceiling bill. So we're unsure. I, I suppose there was a uh, stipulation that unobligated CRISA funds could be taken back if they weren't previously obligated to a project. So we may run into the issue where if we de-obligate these funds, they could be clawed back. Um, so there isn't really a, a precedent I could cite because this is all a little bit new. I might have Ashley answer that. There's some specific rules about reallocating funds. Yeah, sorry. Oh, cool. yeah, like Peter said, it just needs to be a, a new procurement process it's because we can't just like add a chunk of money to the to the existing contract, and so we'll need to write a whole new RFP and go through the whole process. So regardless of whether or not you're wanting to do this other contract with them, you're going to have to de-obligate the funds anyways, as I understand. Is that correct? Basically, yes. Okay. okay. And uh, to clarify, this is some, oh, sorry. You're fine. This is something that we were considering doing before the debt limit bill. The debt limit bill just makes it less clear whether or not we will be able to do it. Any further questions or discussion? All right, I'll make a, a motion that we recommend the Transportation Policy Board approve the uh, Project Selection Committee CRP funding recommendations as presented. Is there a second? A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Or say aye. All opposed? All right, thank you. The next action, the next action is with the uh, CRISPR funds. Make a motion. We recommend the Transportation Policy Board approve the Project Selection Committee's CRISPR funding recommendations as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Approval. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. All opposed? All right, thank you. All right, next we have discussion uh, discussion and updates. A 2023 projects not yet validated. Nick. Thank you. I'll just be doing a brief introduction here. Uh, in April of this year, the TPB approved changes to the reasonable progress policy in the TIP policy document, uh, requiring that at the TAC meeting after May 31st and the TPB meeting after that TAC meeting, uh, that the sponsors of projects programmed to receive WAMPO suballocated federal funds in the current federal fiscal year that have not yet obligated to need to present both in writing and verbally on the statuses of the projects. Now, the language does not go into more detail than that, so we don't really have much in the way of a standard as to what to these updates should consist of. And it will next to and the next week, so they'll be presented here and on the on July 11th of the TPB. And currently, this affects uh, three projects. The Seneca 63rd Street Bike Ped Pathway in Hayesville, West Street Harriet Apani in Wichita, and Meridian from Ford 77th Street North to Seward 69th Street North, and Main to 5th 85th Street North in Valley Center. 
Now, you may notice that two of these are projects that uh, were affected by the administrative adjustment earlier, though uh, the bulk of their uh, funds are still, as of right now, not yet uh, obligated. And, uh, and this year, there were also, uh, I'll, I won't get into that, uh, so, oh, sorry. And the next, and I now turn it over to uh, Mayor Kessler, now acting as representative of Hayesville, rather than as chair of the TAC. All right, thank you, Nick. So I did notice that all three reports are in the packet. There's a link in the packet to click on it. So I'll be speaking on uh, the Hayesville project, which is the Seneca and 63rd Street bike pedestrian pathway project. So the letter that was sent basically states that the agreement um, is expected to come uh, soon with the, the CNM agreement. And since then, the um, CNM C and M agreement has been completed. And PEC is planning to send the final plans to KDOT on July 7th. So, so far, everything is uh, still on track to be completed within the uh, fiscal year. Are there any questions on this? If not, and James, would you like to speak on the Wichita project? James Wagner, representative of the city of Wichita, special projects engineer and project manager, manager for West Street from Harry to Pawnee, uh, project number 87N-0720-01. Um, so next slide, please. Our proposed schedule it was in your packet here. Here's a copy. We have uh, all of our uh, dates set up with our agreement with KDOT. Uh, to do our own set of plans and specs for bidding projects. And we report to the, the BLP. And on August 15th, we have our dates for submitting some of our packets to those guys. And then final uh, ps and &E plans, uh, August 15th. Uh, September 3rd is uh, when we're expecting to have those completed from back from KDOT. And then letting September uh, and final letting plans on September 10th to the BLP. And then uh, September 13th, having the CE agreement executed. And then advertising in September 20th, 21st to, to bid and October 20, 20th bid date. And next slide. Open for questions. Anybody? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, Rodney, representing Valley Center. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rodney Eggleston, the Public Works Director for the City Valley Center, standing in for Brent Clark. Uh, I did see that he did submit our schedule. There. What you see here, he sent a few graphics uh, for some of the streetscaping portion of the project. Uh, this will be a decorative light pole for this is for the section between 5th and Main on the Meridians project. Next slide, please. Here you have a concept. There's the concept of the south portion from 69th Street or Seward up to uh, the railroad tracks or industrial to include the roundabout at 69th Street. Next slide, please. And here you have a concept for between Main and Fifth, and you'll see the <clears throat> bulb outs on the different intersections there to protect the parking lanes along Meridian and also to direct traffic out of the parking lanes. That was the idea. And then uh, updated sidewalks on both sides of the street. It did see that Brent Clark submitted a schedule. Uh, the only real schedule change that needs to happen 
uh, due to uh, right of way and easement acquisitions, the the letting uh, do, 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 do. the letting date <clears throat> will need to shift from September to October with advertisement in September instead. I got this email from our engineer uh, yesterday. I can send this to, if you give me a, someone to send this to, I can send this to for a writing requirement, um, just mainly due to right away and acquisition and easement acquisitions, we'll need to move that letting date back. Any questions? Rod, Rod, yes, sir. What'd you say the new letting date would be? It'd be in October. I don't have the actual date. It just it's be moved back one month. Um, the engineers in constant contact with KDOT, they're aware of all these schedule changes. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have the regional economic metrics. Peter? have here with me, this is Craig Compton. He's with the Center for Economic Development and Business Research. And he's going to give us a report on different demographic and socioeconomic metrics across the WAMPO region. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, again, I'm Craig Compton with the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State. Um, and I'm going to present on uh, two different items. Um, you'll see they're linked to in the agenda. One is the demographic and socioeconomic and one is uh, general economic indicators. Um, and so I'll just give you a few examples of some of the uh, data elements within um, those reports uh, and, and encourage you to uh, conduct your own investigations. Um, so we'll start with demographics and socioeconomics. Um, the few key elements in this report is something we call a, a tapestry segmentation. And so I'll, I'll go into that in a few slides um, and talk about these um, tapestry elements. Um, and then uh, the diversity index map, um, there's also sort of more data-driven elements, uh, which are a direct demographic and in income comparison profile, um, and then an age by sex by race profile of each individual community within the, the WAMPO region. Um, so we'll talk about this diversity index map uh, and just discuss the way to interpret it. Uh, so if you look at um, the scale of this map, the, the lighter um, pink colors um, are kind of the less diverse areas. The bluer areas are uh, more diverse areas um, and it's on a scale from one to 100. Um, so in the middle, uh, anything yellow is at, at about a 50. Um, and the way you can interpret that is if you choose two people at random, uh, what are the odds that they will be of different races? And so you can kind of see the uh, you know map of the Wichita region and toward the city center, you see a greater amount of diversity. Um, but then also as we get get out toward the uh, you know more rural areas, um, there is a little less diversity there. Um, and also the the uh, overall ad index for the United States was uh, 72.9. So this kind of shows how we compare against uh, the US as a whole. Um, these are some actually really cool um, kind of data elements here. Um, we use a platform called Esri, um, and it's based off of uh, GIS and has some um, different layers and uh, is a good way to present different data elements. They uh, created this uh, sort of Rolodex of, of different lifestyles called tapestries. And so if you look on the um, right-hand side there, or I guess your, your left, um, they have all these uh, different names for tapestries like uptown individuals, um, middle ground, uh, senior styles. And so the, they aggregate different groups of people into these specific tapestries and you know uh, allocate that based off how they, uh, like their spending habits, uh, their age, sex, race, their incomes, um, and just their, their general consumer patterns. And so uh, links to that, you know, further uh, definitions are um, in, the, in the agenda. So I would definitely encourage you to kind of look at those tapestry segmentations. Um, and we conducted each of one, of one of these for each individual community in the Wampa region. So this is the Wampa region as a whole. Um, you can see some kind of key facts about it, um, where it discusses the median home value, but also the household income, uh, the education attainment, um, the age profile, and then the household income. 
And then we did, you know, uh, we'll just do one example here, uh, Bel Air, and so we can specify um, how how Bel Air ranks in all these metrics. Um, and then at the very bottom, uh, or sorry, in the middle, uh, we we compare uh, the age profile against against Kansas, um, and so we did that for every single community uh, in the in the Wampo region. Um, moving on to economic development. Um, we worked with the Greater Wichita Partnership. They gave us a list of, of seven different sectors, which we'll go through individually here. Um, and we discussed the, the framework of these sectors um, through the lens of um, transportation and economic development. So the sectors that we got were uh, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, agriculture, energy, healthcare, IT systems and support, and transportation. Um, if you look at the chart, you can see that healthcare has the highest volume of employment, uh, followed by uh, aerospace, um, and then you can see the others short following after. So we'll go in alphabetical order, start with our advanced manufacturing sector. Um, as economists, when we think of um, economic development and transportation, um, we think of the firm and we think of the goods that are going into the firm, so the raw goods um, that they're going to use to produce their products. Uh, then we think of uh, the outbound goods, so, so the products they're um, distributing throughout the community. And then we think of how the labor gets to and from the firm during their commute. So for the uh, for these sectors, we took a, a list of all of the top employers um, with the highest uh, employment volume um, and, and use that as kind of our, our guideline to uh, highlight a few of these different firms. So for example, for the advanced manufacturing um, sector in Wichita, Coleman is the largest employer. When we think of the different goods uh, that are going to come inbound. Um, they're going to use a lot of heavy highway. They're going to use a lot of uh, semi-trucks and freight trucks. Um, and same for their outbound, um, outbound goods, a lot of uh, palletized goods on um, using these heavy highway freight trucks. And then we think of the labor corridor. So the labor is going to get to that uh, Coleman headquarters uh, along uh, 37th via I-35. Uh, but another consideration that we can discuss is Hustler Turf. So Hustler Turf is actually in um, Heston, Newton area, and it's not technically a part of the Wampa region, but we do have a strong labor attraction uh, where lots of folks from Wichita are employed there. And so we need to consider that I-35 corridor um, when, when we're thinking about um, the transportation system for this sector. So then we'll move on to aerospace, uh, kind of uh, topical today, um, you know, considering the, the transportation system and uh, recent impacts uh, that it's had on, or uh, I guess recent impacts that the uh, aerospace sector has had on the transportation system. Um, so we'll talk about our, our big ones, uh, Spirit. Um, they're unique in the fact that they have access to uh, rail. And so that's a, that's a consideration when we're thinking about Spirit is that's a very unique asset that kind of leverage that, leverages them within the, the Wichita community. Um, and same for outba outbound. Um, a lot of those you know, future washes are going to be uh, distributed via rail. Um, and then we can think of Sorry, the labor access and the labor access is going to get to uh, the Spirit headquarters via the KTA, via Oliver, um, via K-15. We can think of our, our two Cessna headquarters. Um, and those uh, both have a lot of the same, same demands um, in terms of uh, the transportation use, but also in terms of labor access, we need to think of the, the corridors where um, those employees ne need to get access to the firm. So for the west uh, location, it's going to be Hoover Road, Southwest Boulevard, east location, um, you know, KTA, that Woodlawn County route. Um, but then another very interesting fact uh, that I'd like to draw attention to for Bombardier Learjet, we can see um, that in the picture there, uh, toward the bottom, uh, there is actually a, a runway going over a road, and that is a unique facet of Wichita's tra transportation system, uh, where we uh, have the ability uh, to create these runways. We have a concentration of engineers with the expertise um, and the construction firms who have constructed these runways. So it's a very unique facet of, of our transportation system that uh, gives us some economic leverage uh, in terms of uh, attracting um, you know, new, new business and new dollars to the Wichita area. 
um, when we think of uh, agriculture from the um, Greater Wichita Partnerships perspective, uh, we don't necessarily think of raw agriculture in terms of the uh, commodities, we think of uh, the agricultural product. And so uh, we think of the kind of processing of, of the uh, agricultural goods. Our largest employer um, in this kind of processing sector is going to be Cargill. Um, they also have um, access to rail inbound and outbound, um, and their labor force is uh, going to mostly be at that new Washington location. Um, the second largest farm is called Smithfield Foods, and they're mostly going to be heavy highway, um, those palletized trucks. Um, their location is on Pawnee. And then uh, down right downtown, we can think of you know High Highland Dairy um, and the uh, have a heavy highway trucks that need to navigate through downtown um, in order to get to that location on Central. Uh, same story for Land Lakes Purina. Um, another element that I'll draw your attention to that's frequently seen throughout the in each of these sectors uh, is this growth chart or this growth matrix on the bottom right hand corner um, or bottom left hand corner for you guys. Um, the so Wichita is the orange bubble, um, and it just shows the, the wage growth over the past year and the employment growth, and then the size of the bubble is going to be the volume of employment. So uh, we saw growth in wages, we saw growth in employment, but we do have a smaller um, employment volume in this sector than a lot of other communities that we compared against. I'll go back to um, aerospace just so you can see um, that we have a, a larger bubble than most of the other communities that we compared against. Um, and so the way we chose the communities was we picked five Midwestern communities to compare ourselves against. Uh, we picked Omaha, Tulsa, Kansas City, uh, Des Moines, and Oklahoma City. But then we also picked other uh, communities that are known for their aerospace, agriculture, healthcare sectors, um, and looked at those strong cities and how we compare against them. So we'll move on to energy. Um, the biggest name in energy in Wichita is going to be Coke Industries, um, and they've got an employment volume of 3,000 persons. So uh, that labor access um, no, mostly needs to get to their location um, off of Oliver, um, and they're going to use you know K36 or they're going to use 37 via I-35. And most of the goods that are coming in and out uh, are going to use heavy highway, um, much like Hustler Turf, uh, Frontier, and BG are in El Dorado. And they're more of the you know energy refining or oil refining, um, and so while they're not technically in uh, the region, we do have a labor attraction. We do have folks commuting uh, to and forth to and from there. So uh, that's a consideration when we're um, evaluating the transportation system. And then Oxychem uh, is kind of down in the southwest corner of uh, Wichita Off Ridge Road. Um, they're also another firm that has access to to rail, um, which is kind of a a uh, unique facet of, of their business, um, but also when we think of attracting new firms to uh, the Wichita region and using uh, the rail line, uh, we you know can view that as a, both a benefit and a linchpin um, because properties along the rail line and access to rail line and the negotiation with the management of the rail line um, are all sort of uh, limiting factors in terms of uh, you know trying to uh, advertise or leverage that as part of our transportation system. So we'll move on to healthcare. Uh, this was the largest sector in terms of employment, so we had to break it up into two uh, you know, different segments. Um, one, we're just going to talk about the the hospitals, uh, and then we'll talk about doctors' offices. So um, when we talk about uh, hospitals, you know, it's it's hard to evaluate. Uh, the, the growth of healthcare, because it's largely dependent on population. People are kind of going to use healthcare at a consistent rate because it's got this, you know, inelastic demand. Uh, you know, no one's going to not call 911 uh, if they're having a heart attack. So um, we can kind of expect this continued growth as the Wichita population um, increases and just uh, consider the access of the entire community to get to these uh, vital hospitals. Um, and when we think of the economic aspect of that, you know, these hospitals um, do generate a significant um, wealth within the uh, community, but they also um, host um, strong labor forces, um, you know, that, that then 
propagate their uh, money throughout the community. So uh, the two main hospitals are going to be Wesley, which has 760 beds. Um, you know, they're a level one trauma center uh, and a session via Christie. The other level one trauma center um, is uh, 421 beds. And so uh, we can think of both of those hospitals as we evaluate the transportation system. And then the amount of doctor's offices is pretty robust. Uh, we've got Quite, quite a few offices. So the easiest way that we could uh, kind of break that down was by zip code um, and evaluate how many offices um, each zip code has. And so if we look at um, these offices, they include uh, therapists, they include dentist offices, they include, um, you know, audiologists and uh, pretty much any any medical office. And so uh, if you look at the downtown corridor, it's got a very strong kind of location quotient for uh, these, these doctor's offices. Um, you know, it's just the amount of businesses. Um, they're lar lar largely attached to the hospitals, um, but, uh, or part of the hospital systems, but there are quite a few uh, of these um, doctor's offices in that downtown corridor, along with kind of the East Wichita, um, you know, in Northwest Wichita, Bel Air region. Um, so all of these locations have more than 500 doctor's offices and each of those locations has a multitude of employees. So it's a, it's a pretty robust sector. Um, and I think Peter might have an interesting graphic for us um, at the end where uh, we kind of evaluate these and look at the density of it. So, um, that's just a teaser for, for later. Uh, we'll finish up with uh, IT systems and support and then transportation. Um, for IT systems, we need to think of the sector as a whole. Um, it is kind of moving toward this more remote uh, workforce, except in terms of infrastructure. So um, InfoSync is the largest IT systems uh, company in the Wichita area, but their workforce is more largely going remote and so access to their main headquarters is um, in terms of transportation is dwindling uh, we can look at cox however on the infrastructure side and they they do have a demand for um transportation so you know the map that we see here is actually just of the the cox parking lot you can see there's Plenty of parking dedicated to uh, the employee parking, but then uh, on the uh, bottom half and around the outskirts of the parking lot, they've got all these freight vehicles um, and different utility vehicles that need access um, around around the city, um, and especially you know to exit and enter uh, that that business so that um, you know they can conduct their work and uh, provide the infrastructure that is so so vital to the economic activity within the region. Um, the overall, this is uh, poised for this industry is poised for growth with the addition of Integra. Um, you know they're they're claiming um, you know thousands of, of jobs at that at that location at 254 on Rock, and so uh, considering how we're going to get the labor force uh, to Integra is going to be uh, important part of the conversation of growth moving forward. So we'll finish up with uh, the transportation system. And when we, th when we think transportation, think, uh, you know, just, just logistics, um, but also you know, if we look at, uh, you know, transportation equipment such as uh, cherry, cherry lifts or, um, you know, big trucks, uh, the largest provider of these is going to be the Berry, Berry Company. Um, and they've got their, they've got a few different locations um, throughout town. And the, one of the largest is that the showroom um, off of Kellogg. Um, and, you know, with that showroom, the thing that need, we need to take into consideration is those trucks moving in and out, moving kind of those, those tractor trailers with those big heavy equipment pieces um, and how they can effectively uh, get around town, get to the job site and get to the showroom. Um, and then another important part of the transportation cost conversation is for a student, which is a large employer of school bus drivers, but also uh, gets our kids kids to school, uh, which is just a, an important conversation of the transportation system overall. So now we've got some fun maths for you guys. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. So with the uh, economic reports generated by Craig and the Centers for Economic Development and Business Research, we created a couple maps here. So what you're looking at here, it's the 2022 WAMPO key corridors and major private employers. So all the different color circles you can see up there are some of the largest employers by location um, in the WAMPO area. Um, 
and they're color coded by the different segment they're in from one of the seven segments. And now the more obvious one, and you might have already guessed the one in the southeast part of Wichita that's real big, the light blue, that's aerospace and specifically that Spirit Aerosystems. They have one location uh, for our data source, data axle that has 15,000 people. And it kind of dwarfs all of the other locations uh, in that kind of size realm. But everything else is there from our, you know, Wesley Medical Center, Cargill, Coleman, Oak Industries for, in, or for Energy. Um, but now I'll talk about the key corridors, which are in red. And essentially, yes, it is a map of our largest highways and some of our major arterials, but it was important to consider how we made this map. So in the larger economic reports that were generated, it goes sector by sector. And in each sector, there's a section about WAMPO main thoroughfares. We pulled that information and then we slowly highlighted which parts of the roadmap they use from the business. So we went from business to roads and slowly this map of roads revealed itself. So it's quite encouraging to see this direct connection from our businesses to our most expensive infrastructure. And then next, because we didn't want to underrepresent this area, because as Craig was saying, healthcare is our largest employment sector. It edges out aerospace. Um, this is a heat map of all the different doctors, clinics, therapists, anywhere there's a small healthcare employer across Wichita. And it's quite extensive. And as Craig was describing, we are the farthest west metropolitan area compared to our peers, Kansas City and Oklahoma City. And we serve all sorts of specialty care for all of Western Kansas. Because if you keep going that direction, if you're near the border, a lot of times it may be us or Denver, so we serve very special care that really kind of congregates in Wichita. And we just didn't want to leave that out because the other map really doesn't show how big of an area of employment this is. And I think that wraps up for us. Any questions for myself or Craig? I think it's a lot of interesting uh, facts. Uh, something uh, need to go back in there and look and click on the link and uh, check all that stuff out. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. I, I do have a quick question. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. On the healthcare map, does that include nursing homes, senior living, assisted living, independent living, uh, memory care type places or strictly healthcare um, directly? To my knowledge, that one, uh, does involve uh, nursing homes and those kind of healthcare facilities, um, long-term care, LTACs, long-term acute care homes, things like that. Yep, yep, I would agree. Great, thank you. I have a question as well. I saw on the healthcare sector reference Mental Health Association, but I didn't see it reference ComCare, and I know they have a very large employment of uh, uh, psychiatrists, doctors, and clinicians? Mm -hmm. We'd have to go look at the specific employment by location. So the information we have on employers is by location. So ComCare may be a large single employer, but if they have multiple locations with smaller numbers, they won't bubble up to the top of the list per se. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys, Thank you. appreciate it. All right, next we have the 5310 awards, Dora. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dora Guile, transportation planner here at Wempo. Now I'll be going over the 5310 awards. So the 5310, Grant program is also known as the Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities Program. And it's uh, an FDA, it's, it's a program administrated by FDA, the Federal Transit Administration. 
The program focuses on supporting transportation services that go beyond traditional public transportation, such as parent transit, wheelchair accessible vans, and any other specialized vehicles. The federal funding amount available for this year's Section 5310 program has funding from the federal fiscal years 2021 and 2022, and those are the amounts, and it totals up to be $1,077,144. And the program timeline for this year's funding is July 1st through June 30th of 2025. There was three members for the selection committee and they scored these projects based on demonstration of need, addressing accessibility and our collaboration goals, meeting specific needs of older adults and or with disabilities. And they're coordinated with the transit district number nine member status. And here's a table that shows the breakdown of the, the federal funds awarded and the agency. Uh, is there any questions, comments? Raven is also here. She can elaborate a little bit more if needed. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have committee and partnership updates. Alan Keller, are you online or safety? Dr. Bond, okay, no, no reports. Mr. Chair, no reports. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we have other business. Ashley. Thank you. We just wanted to bring up the idea of potentially moving this meeting because it's a Monday morning meeting, which is not fun necessarily. Um, so, just wanted to bring up the thought of what about moving it to Tuesday or maybe moving it to Monday afternoon so we had some time to prepare in the morning. We would just want to have this initial discussion and probably have this discussion several times and it will have to eventually be approved by TPB. So what are your all's thoughts? Uh, I would just, I would, from our standpoint, recommend trying to stay away from Tuesday, mostly because of okay. <clears throat> Wichita City Council meetings, and that can take multiple people here away from this meeting for an unknown period of time. Our, our chair's schedule is good for Monday. Uh, our chair is, uh, is, his time is off on Monday, but his schedule is tied on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So if we were to move to a Monday afternoon, how would that work for people? That would not work for Central County. Okay. First, we do do other understanding meetings. KDOT would not be available on, on part of Monday afternoons. Okay. Maybe we'll keep it where it is. <laughs> Um, we can have further discussions as well. I did wonder about having Kendra speak since I think the speakers are working now. Is that okay, Mayor? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Hello. So yes, my name is Kendra Shank. I work for Burgess and Naipaul, one of the consultants on the project for the SS4A grant. I just wanted to go back to that topic about the um, application that we're preparing right now. So we're submitting on as Ashley talked about at the beginning of the meeting, um, a planning and demonstration grant to do supplemental planning activities and demonstration. So looking at some behavioral education campaigns um, through marketing purposes, whether it's TV ads, Facebook, social media, um, radio, those sorts of things at specific schools or with a specific employer. And then looking at supplemental planning activities in terms of before and after studies. So looking at safety improvements that have already been implemented in the region and how those are currently working. Um, are they working well? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, and then if if they're they're working, where else can we implement those sorts of improvements as well? So that's the application that we're submitting um, that hopefully in the next Hopefully this week, maybe next week, will be submitted um, for uh, this round of Safe Streets and Roads for All funding. 
All right, thank you, Kendra. And then Maggie from KDOT had to jump off, but she wrote in the chat, the SS4 match pilot program supports the strategic highway safety plan to prioritize safety on all public roads in Kansas, especially since from 2018 to 2022, 61% of all severe injuries occurred on local roads. We're very excited for the WAMPO application. Thank you. To find out more, please visit uh, KDOT website, which is chaosdot.gov slash SS4A slash program information dot ASP. All right. All opposed? Nobody. All right. Thank you. Thank you.